Black Radio pregame show as we get you set for Saturday's kickoff. Now here's your host, Kyle Charter. Purdue is a heavy underdog when it travels to the big house Saturday night to take on Michigan. What can the Boilermakers do short of cheating to even the playing field? Let's preview the primetime game on the Golden Black Radio pregame podcast. I'm Kyle Charters, Tom Deanhart, Brian Newbert, and Alan Karpik here as well. Well, Tom, the Boilermakers will travel up to Ann Arbor, a big underdog against the Wolverines, 32 and a half points. Man, this is going to be a challenging one for the Boilermakers. Purdue is going to have to find a lot of areas where it makes improvements from last week. Then it's probably, too, going to have to get some breaks from the Wolverines as well, maybe multiple breaks, and then make some things happen. It's a steep hill, uh, but these two will go ahead and play the game on Saturday night in the big house. Yeah, I mean, where, where, where do you start, Kyle? I mean, um, you talk about a steep, uh, steep hill, a titanic challenge here. I don't know, you know. Um, do you believe in miracles, Kyle Charters? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the last time Purdue was, was, was at least this heavy of an underdog, they did pull an upset. They beat Notre Dame back in 1974, so there you go, right? Yeah. I guess anything's possible, but this this looks like, a, again, a challenge of all challenges here. This Michigan team, as you all know, they're good, number one, right? They're 8-0, 5-0 in the Big Ten, ranked number two in the country. They're coming off a bye week, and I think all this sign-stealing investigation, these allegations, I, I think this is this is served – to sort of cause a program to circle the wagons and us against the world mentality, Kyle. And they're going to have a national television audience on NBC Saturday night to show the world what they're all about. And I think they're going to want to send a message. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the hope from a Purdue perspective was that maybe Michigan would be distracted. I think the more likely scenario is the one that you present and that you know, Michigan's going to be galvanized by this and feel like it needs to go out there and prove that its defense is as good as the numbers suggest that it is without having the opponent's signs. Uh, because clearly, you know, Purdue's going to be prepared to, to not be using its typical signs for this game on, on Saturday night. Uh, the numbers, though, are incredibly good for the Wolverines' defense. I mean, they're giving up 5.9 points per game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, you know, 47 points in eight games. They have allowed, Tom, opponents... Only nine trips inside the red zone. Of those nine trips, the teams have only scored three times. Only one of those three times was a touchdown. Uh, I mean, the numbers just keep going on and on. I mean, the defense is 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 really good. It's hard to beat any team when they're allowing you less than six points uh, per contest. But uh, they have good players. Perhaps they've known the opponent's signs, too. But the players are also very good, and that has made it really difficult for teams to get any traction offensively against them. Yeah, you're right. Uh, some people think this is Michigan's best defense since the 1997 team led by Charles Woodson, of course, won a co-national championship. Uh, not going to argue with it with uh, people in and out of the field that way because, as you pointed out, the numbers certainly uh, certainly play the notion this is an extra special defense. Uh, yeah, you know uh, – uh, the, the strength is probably the front, Kyle, the defensive line, the interior. Uh, that's where they can really get after teams. You know, Will Johnson's a terrific cornerback, one of the best cornerbacks in America. So yeah, up and down that, that roster on defense, they, uh, they, they, they bring a lot of talent and a lot of vim and vigor. And conversely, you got the Purdue offense. And uh, I think we've chronicled the struggles on that side of the ball for, for, for several weeks now, Kyle. The last three games, they've scored a total of 28 points. Last week at Nebraska was a bit of a nadir. They had 195 yards of offense, the fewest yet this season. And each of the last four games, they've seen the total yardage go down. So they're really searching for answers. They're struggling, Kyle. They're beat up. And now now they walk into the teeth of this, this Michigan defense, uh, playing again in front of a hostile crowd. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this offense holds up. And Kyle, if they can even get on the board. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem here is Purdue's injuries along its front against that defense that you mentioned is very good along its front. I mean, Purdue's going to be missing its starting offensive tackles. That's never a good scenario yeah. for any team. It seems particularly harmful for a team that has struggled up front, has struggled offensively, has a quarterback in Hudson Card who I think is feeling the effects of 
a pocket that's not always holding up the way he or Purdue would like it to. Uh, n- not an easy way to play the position, I don't think. That in combination with receivers who don't appear to be getting as yeah. much separation as what you would like. It's a it's a bad combo for Purdue, and I'm not sure that I'm not sure that even fixing any one of those things really solves the problem. You've got to be able to fix all those pieces to really get this offense clicking again. I'm, I'm just not sure that Purdue can do that in a short week. Now, maybe they can get some plays. Maybe Michigan makes some mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you get some short fields. I'm not saying Purdue can't win the game, but straight up, uh, you know, Purdue's going to have some trouble offensively. It's going to have to find some other avenues in which to equal the playing field against the Wolverines. I'm just not sure what those avenues are. Like you said, unless, unless Michigan really implodes here as four or five turnovers, if Purdue can score on defense or special teams, if this offense can get some type of traction, Kyle, uh, I think we talked about this earlier this week, some type of traction to keep the ball away from Michigan's offense. Um, that, that would obviously... Uh, bode well for the Boilermakers. How they do that with the run game, I'm not sure. You talked about the two tackles for Purdue being out, Musa and Bo, two backups. Uh, one of them, this guy starting now, is, is a NA, former NAIA player. And uh, how are they going to get a consistent push? I'm not sure. I think your observations of Hudson Carter spot on. I think he's become a little gun shy, understandably. And the receivers, too. Um, just not there, Kyle. There's no, like you said, there's no separation. It's a struggle to get guys open. Time and again, it seems like Hudson Card drops back, and he's scanning the field, looking, 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 and he's shuffling to the left or the right, and and invariably forces a pass, gets sacked, or, or throws it out of bounds. And it, it's got to be exasperating for a lot of people. And the running game's been pretty solid, but I'm not sure if Mockaby or Tracy again how much traction they get against this rugged Michigan front. Purdue played defense well last week, uh, you know, maybe well enough to, to win the game uh, against Nebraska. I mean, they had really three guys out there who were stars defensively, Dylan Thieneman, uh, Kydra Jenkins, and Nick Scorton. Uh, those two, those three really might have played individually their best games uh, yeah. of the year, maybe the best games of their careers, but um, it's hard to do that uh, and, and just be three guys out there playing. You, you need more help than that. Well, no, this too. J.J. McCarthy's not Heinrich Harburg or Deacon Hill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> J.J. McCarthy's the best quarterback in the Big Ten, one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. So, yeah, the defense played pretty well, but, but they weren't going against a couple of juggernaut offenses two of the last three weeks outside of the Ohio State game. So this is a whole other animal. And we talk so much about Michigan's defense. The offense is very good as well. You know, last year, Kyle, they were more Donovan Edwards, Blake Corm, really run the ball. They can still do that. This this Michigan team's a little bit more pass heavy. And McCarthy's become that straw that stirs the drink. Yeah. A real special guy having a real special season. He can beat you with his feet. <clears throat> he can beat you with his arm. Full of confidence right now. He smells blood in the water, I think, here. So uh, yeah, this is this is going to be a supreme challenge for that defense, but you're right, boy. Purdue's got two special outside linebackers in Jenkins and Scorton. And Dylan Thieneman continues to impress as well. Um, but but he, he, even the heroics of those guys may not be enough to slow down this Michigan offense. Let's get a weather update here in just a moment for Saturday night in Ann Arbor. We'll bring in Brian Newbert. Uh, we'll talk to uh, him, get his perspective. Maybe we'll talk a little bit of sign stealing uh, <laughs> with Brian. We'll also talk to Alan Karpik. Get a little Big Ten update, look at historical view as well. We'll do all that and much more. You're listening to Golden Black Radio. Hello from News 18. I'm Storm Team 18 meteorologist Julia Prickett. The Purdue Boilermakers head up to Ann Arbor, Michigan this Saturday to take on the number two ranked Michigan Wolverines. It's looking to be a mild day overall in Ann Arbor. And if you'll be up in Michigan early Saturday morning, temperatures are looking to be in the mid 40s by 10. We'll stay in the mid-50s through the afternoon with a breeze coming from the south-southwest anywhere from 7 to 9 miles per hour. By kickoff at 7.30, high of 49 degrees with possible isolated shower chances that potentially could impact game time, but not likely. I recommend packing warm with the cooler temperatures and possible rain showers. 
After the game, Ann Arbor will sit in the mid-40s for your overnight hours and into Saturday morning. All in all, the Boilermakers should prepare for a chilly and breezy trip to Michigan Stadium. From News 18, I'm Storm Team 18 meteorologist Julia Prickett. As always, boiler up, hammer down. Designing and building since 1968, TNW has changed the way people think about construction. TNW's three-stage approach to designing and building is unmatched throughout the construction industry. Learn more about TNW's people, passion, and projects at TWDesignBuild.com. Experience unparalleled comfort, service, and cuisine at the Whitaker Inn. This Midwestern oasis is perfect for a relaxing staycation or weekend getaway. Escape from the ordinary at the Whitaker Inn. It's time to break it down as we go in-depth about Purdue's opponent. Hey, we got Chris, the great Chris Ballas, the Wolverine.com, one of the premier sites on the On3 network. Chris, always good to talk. Boilermakers trek into Ann Arbor, 7.30 p.m. primetime tilt with Michigan. First, kind of tell our listeners what to expect or what they can expect from the Michigan offense. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, J.J. McCarthy is really the guy that keeps this thing going now. And you know, the last couple of years, it's been the running game, and they've been dominating people that way. Frankly, the running game's been average this year, and J.J. McCarthy's the guy keeping this thing going. Everybody looks at that score against Michigan State, for example, 49 to nothing, and says, okay, um, it is, uh, you know, they ran right through them. They didn't. They were converting third and 18s, third and 17s, third and 14s, and that was all J.J. McCarthy. So uh, keeping plays alive. And, and uh, throwing the ball and, uh, and really going to his second and third receivers. So uh, he's really what makes this up, and that's work. But I think it's only, you know, people think it's still only a matter of time before this running game gets going. I think by game eight, um, you are kind of what you are. And, uh, yeah, I think there's some room for improvement there. But Donovan Edwards is averaging less than four yards per carry. They just aren't where they were they've been. So I think you're going to see more of a passing attack here for Michigan going forward and for the rest of the year. Defensively, Chris, what can fans, the Boilermaker fans, expect to see from, from that side of the ball from Michigan? Yeah, one of the best defenses I've ever seen at Michigan, and that's saying something. This, you know, we go back to 1997 being the standard when they allowed less than nine points per game, and of course, offenses have evolved even since then. But uh, the defensive line is the strongest that I've seen in the interior since I've been covering Michigan, really since I've been watching Michigan. And you no, know, the edges aren't like Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo, guys that were first round picks and the pros are second round picks. But they are more than capable, especially when combined with a dominant interior line. So it's really made life miserable for quarterbacks. They aren't able to get out of the pocket because they are just constricting the pocket and keeping those guys in there and smothering them. And then you've got an elite cornerback and Will Johnson and linebackers that can really run. So uh, it's tough to move the ball. Um, Minnesota was probably the best in terms of the run game because they stretched them out and they, and they threw a little stretch zone in there. But when Michigan adjusted, they couldn't do it either. And it was all over. So lots of speed, lots of NFL talent on this team, and especially up front, this is as good as they've been. Just lastly, last question, Chris. Got to ask, all, all that's going on up there, all the off-field stuff, I mean, impact you think that could have on Michigan psychologically uh, when this thing's kicked off Saturday night? I think they're galvanized. I think they're ready to prove that, okay, you think we, you know, we beat you because we stole your signs. Uh, let's show you that we didn't, uh, like they did against Michigan State. Michigan State got a heads up that, hey, maybe Michigan knows your signs. And uh, Michigan went out there and uh, beat them 49 to nothing. And it really wasn't that close, frankly, but it could have been 70. So I think you're going to see a motivated team. Now, if there's any other horrible or really bad news that drops, that maybe affects some of the coaches this year. And you never know in things like this, Tom, as you know, you've been around a long time like me, then maybe that changes. But right now they are out to prove something. They're on a mission. Good stuff, Chris Ballas. Thank you very much for dropping some Michigan knowledge on us. Look forward to seeing you Saturday, buddy. Always, man. Thank you. On the far end of Main Street in downtown Lafayette, you'll find East End Grill, industrial and classic. The restaurant is built like a steakhouse, but handles like a bistro. East End Grill's menu includes creative starters, simple chopped salads, burgers, fresh fish, and steaks, and the signature shrimp and grits. The staff prepares every item from scratch and emphasizes simple meals that incorporate fresh, local, and seasonal ingredients. A warm and inviting dining room features a cozy bar that includes a great selection of craft beer, inspired cocktails, and a robust and expanding wine list. Whatever your entertainment needs are, a cocktail at the bar, dinner with family, or a special event in the private dining room, the energized and attentive staff is here for you. Eastern Grill in downtown Lafayette, welcome to our table. 
When it comes to land sales, it pays to have experts in your corner. AcrePro Midwest Farm Group is your local farmland specialist. With decades of experience in Indiana agriculture, no one knows the market better. Whether you're doing a 1031 exchange or simply buying and selling farmland, your local AcrePro agent will walk the land with you and ensure the deal is done right. Visit AcrePro.com or call 765-775-6502 and talk to your local land expert today. Again, 765-775-6502. At Purdue Federal Credit Union, it's about a relationship. A relationship that goes where you go, wherever you are in life. A relationship that's committed to free financial wellness resources, lower fees, and innovative digital banking solutions. Because we believe in people helping people. Let's build your financial future together. Purdue Federal Credit Union, your trusted financial partner for life. Federally insured by NCUA. This is the Golden Black Radio pregame show, the most in-depth guide to Saturday's game you'll find, featuring the staff of Golden Black. Let's bring in Brian Newbert to get his perspective on Purdue and Michigan, the Boilermakers. Uh, will be well prepared to take on the Wolverines. The Wolverines might be well prepared to take on Purdue, but in some atypical ways, uh, perhaps, on Saturday night. On, on a serious note, I mean, the Big Ten coaches about this whole sign-stealing scandal, uh, Brian, the Big Ten coaches a couple of times, uh, it's been reported now this week, uh, have been in contact with the Big Ten, upset about uh, this whole scandal. Ryan Walters on his radio show, on Thursday night said it's not so much of an allegation is as that it is true. Uh, we know, we am speaking for him know that, uh, people have been in Purdue stadium this year. He said, um, what do you think about all this? Uh, what happens with Michigan, uh, if anything, before the end of this season and what has seemingly become a, a growing scandal up there in Ann Arbor? Yeah, they're not going to deep six Michigan season. Um, Welcome to being Big Ten Commissioner, Tony Petiti. Your first act of your first act of as commissioner is to have is to preside over a mutiny of thirteen other schools brought on by one of your flagships cheating. Um no, they're they're not gonna sanction Michigan this season. Uh I don't know if they even can. Um, because A, if you do that, you're gonna get a call from Fox and they're gonna be like, Wait, what? Yeah. Um, we just gave you a billion dollars for what now? Um, you know, Michigan still swings a big stick in, in this conference and, um, it is what it is. You know, the big ones eat the little ones, as I always say. And, uh, I, I just don't think there's anything that's going to happen in the short term other than Michigan being shamed and having to stop doing it. Um, I think there's enough evidence out there that clearly this was, this was something that not only happened, but happened to almost, almost to a comedic extent and was executed very poorly by somebody who, um, is obviously not, um, a normal, uh, aspiring coach. Uh, I mean, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's seems like a colorful individual. Um, shall we say an overzealous fellow? Yeah. Um, but, no, I, I don't think anything's going to come of this this year. Uh, I, I doubt anything comes of this ever, but I'm sure there will be some sort of rule change that comes from it, just like there's everything, just as comes from every loophole that Jim Harbaugh tries to drive a bus through. Um, but uh, no, it's 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 uh, not a coincidence, most likely, that all of this started happening a couple of years ago, clearly. And now all of a sudden, after being on the hot seat, Jim Harbaugh has... has the hottest program in the country. I, I, that's yeah. just not, that's too big a coincidence. Um, and I hear th- the other side of the argument that, oh, well, you still could have stopped the plays. Well, Michigan still has the best players. And that's even more reason to not have to cheat. Like, yeah. what are, what statement are you making here? Like, we have all the best players, but we still need to cheat because apparently we're not very good coaches. Um, or our players aren't as good as everybody thinks they are. Uh that's just – it's just an absolutely absurd story. College football, the gift that keeps giving the whole year, this is this is a story unique to college football. Um, I understand no, I mean, that a, New England Patriots 
things that have happened over the years, but this is the the entertainment college football is always good for. Yeah, I mean it's it's almost a perfect 2023 story because you, you have uh, a guy with a manifesto. I'm not writing 600 pages of anything uh, <laughs> for the record, <laughs> and and you've got video. You know, uh, this as I tweeted uh, today, uh, uh, Michigan apparently is just now learning that the that, that the games are on TV uh, and that the, the guys on the sideline. Uh, and well, he, he should have worn a fake mustache. I, yeah, like, that would have been the perfect. <laughs> that would have been the, the the chef's kiss on the whole story. Would would have been the fake mustache. Yeah. Um, Bill Murray hiding in the bushes. He Go wore green so you could hide. Full Bobby uh, Valentine. Uh, yeah, you know, no, uh, it, it's just absurd. I mean, it's just it, it's obviously. I mean. Okay, I, I suppose maybe there wasn't any sort of knowledge on Jim Harbaugh's part, but I, my guess is probably a wink and a nod. And uh, clearly those coordinators knew what was going on. They clearly had a guy in their ear during games. Hey, they're going to do this now, but never said, hey, how do you know that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, I, I, it's just so unbelievable. But I, I, suppose, I suppose Harbaugh could be insulated uh, in a Tony Soprano sort of insulation way. Um, but what are you going to do now? I mean, yeah. it's, it's what, what happens now is that if there, if there are no, if, if there's no blowback to Michigan, everyone's going to start doing this. And all of a sudden ticket sales are going to boom all over the big 10 because everybody's going to have, uh, everybody's going to have people, at everybody else's games. If not that every fan in every stadium has now been deputized by their program to do this for their program without being urged to, because every anybody can film anything, right? Yeah. And anybody can put anything on social media, right? I mean, it, it, it's all the playbooks out there to quote the Southern district of New York. We have your playbook. <laughs> um, so they, everybody's signs are going to be everywhere now. So maybe this changes football, you know, well, Maybe that, this that, takes tempo out of the equation. Maybe this brings you back to the huddle. Um, damn it, social media. Damn it, technology. Well, the one thing, it'll probably bring the electronic, you know, headset, you know, the, the, the NFL, you know, being able to talk well, to the quarterback and, and all of that. And, but what if know, it doesn't work? Yeah, I don't know. Like, but you I'm just a don't writer you, and. I, I have more Wi-Fi issues in, in, in arenas and stadiums than, you know, yeah. people could ever know. What if it doesn't work? Um, so you don't you think know. anything will happen this year, even with the Big Ten code? I mean, they have now twice this week uh, reportedly sort of uh, between the coaches themselves and the the, the, uh, the other 13 teams' administrations have, have beat this drum with the Big Ten commissioner a couple times. Yeah. No, you don't think anything happens? No. Like – other than Fox, who runs the Big Ten? Right. Ohio State, Michigan. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Rutgers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it, it's just not. I, I, I just perhaps I'm too jaded. But do you really want to get sideways with Michigan with everything that's going on in college football nowadays? Not really. Exactly. You know, it, it's it's just. That's just the way of the world, man. You know, it, it's it's uh, there has never been parody, and there never will be parody. It, it's just you, uh, your money makers can do what they want, and uh, you know, I guess I guess that's not necessarily unique to sports. Certainly not unique to college sports, but it's kind of the way of the world. So, um, maybe at some point there's a public reprimand uh, released at seven thirty p.m. on a Friday night. <laughs> I don't know, but I would not anticipate there being any vacated wins. I would not expect Purdue to suddenly be crowned last year's Big Ten champion. <laughs> um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't expect any sort of – what can the Big Ten do? The answer is can't do anything. Like, yeah. who can do anything? What are we going to go back to the federal government? Hey, after you're done fixing NIL, can you sanction Michigan? <laughs> they, sent, they sent kids to college football games to – film video with their cell phones. Wait, what? <laughs> you know, like 
Um, yeah. it, 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 it's just too, it's just too bizarre to believe unless, you know, you're aware of, you know, Jim Harbaugh being crazy and manic and, and, uh, all of this stuff. And, you know, um, for every rule, there is somebody who did something to create that rule. And, mm -hmm. uh, I finally remember the days of, of, of schools having to run all over the country to host camps because because Michigan found a loophole and created the, the satellite camp um, behind the music uh, episode. Right. And, uh, of course, Michigan was recruiting during COVID on campus somehow, allegedly, right? Uh, yeah. I, I guess I don't have to, have, to, have to say allegedly because Michigan sanctioned itself in that regard. Um, but if you're Michigan, you know, why do you have to do this stuff? It's like what I always used to say about Indiana basketball under, under Calvin and Crean and all those guys, like you're Indiana, just recruit coach. And you should be better than most people. You got a lot of advantages. You don't necessarily have to break rules to find more. Yeah. Um, Maybe if, but, Michigan, if Michigan wasn't doing this, their defense would be giving up nine and a half points per game instead of, 5.9. Yeah. 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 Well, it is certainly <laughs> helpful when you know what the other team is going to run. Uh, that's There's no way around that. I mean, you see these videos, right, of mm -hmm. Connor Stallions uh, whispering in the ears of coordinators and then the team doing exactly what the lip readers told us he was telling the coordinator. Yeah. Um, I understand, you know, you can't take everything from a video or a still photo, but there's enough of it out there now where I don't think there's some, like, fake video mill in Eastern Europe creating this stuff to try to sow chaos in the Big Ten. I think it's yeah. it's pretty evident this has been a this has been a pretty big deal. And, again, like, you, you look at it, like, Jim Harbaugh was about to lose his job a couple of years ago. Yeah. Right? They wanted him out of town. And now all of a sudden you've beaten Ohio State two years in a row and you've looked really good doing it. You have the best team in the country right now. You're killing everybody on your schedule. Yeah. Uh, you have the best players and you have the other team's playbook. So that those are two pretty big advantages. Certainly helps, it seems. Thank you, Brian. No problem. We'll take a break. Back with more. This is Golden Black Radio. Designing and building since 1968, TNW has changed the way people think about construction. TNW's three-stage approach to designing and building is unmatched throughout the construction industry. Learn more about TNW's people, passion, and projects at TWDesignBuild.com. Experience unparalleled comfort, service, and cuisine at the Whitaker Inn. This Midwestern oasis is perfect for a relaxing staycation or weekend getaway. Escape from the ordinary at the Whitaker Inn. What else is going on around the league? Let's take a look. It's the Big Ten Roundup. Let's bring in Alan Carpenter to talk some Big Ten football. Six games uh, outside of uh, Purdue and Michigan. We'll go ahead and skip that Ohio State Rutgers game. The Buckeyes are favored by 18 and a half points in Piscataway. Let's go to another of the noon kickoffs. Alan, talk a little bit of Wisconsin and Indiana. Wisconsin is five and three, three and two in the Big Ten. Indiana is looking for its first Big Ten win, just two and six overall. The Badgers on the road, favored by nine and a half points. You know, Indiana played well last week against Penn State. I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if that was more Indiana or more Penn State, but man, uh, wins hard to come by here for Indiana. It's going to be an interesting final month of the season for Tom Allen and company. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting about what Indiana did, and I suppose if you're looking at the Purdue Michigan formula, any level of Purdue, any opportunity for Purdue to have success, you have to have kind of what happened in the first part of that Penn State game where a couple of blown coverages, a couple of long touchdown passes. I don't know if the first one was actually blown coverage. It was kind of a flukish type play. And that made Indiana look like they were really competitive. And they were. I mean, uh, they you have to give the Hoosiers credit to how they played Penn State. I, you know, I, I, I think Wisconsin still has some things to play for. They've kind of had a, you know, kind of a ho, ho hum season at five and three. I think they're going to be a lot better over the years with Luke Fickle, but I think they'll go down and, and take care of business because they can pound the ball enough 
to get the job done. But uh, but they're suspect offensively, so you don't want to let Indiana jump on you. But I think Wisconsin will just physically will handle things enough to get out of Bloomington alive. Noon kick in East Lansing, Michigan State hosting Nebraska. The Spartans are 0 5 in the Big Ten, 2 and 6 overall. Nebraska could get bowl eligible with a <laughs> victory, 5 and 3, 3 and 2. Uh, and there's this Michigan State no longer is the uh, team in the state of Michigan that seems to be embroiled in the most controversy at the moment. <laughs> uh, the headlines are at the other school uh, right now. Uh, Michigan, or, uh, excuse me, Nebraska is just a three-point favorite in this one. I, I guess it's on the road, but it does seem like, you know, this Nebraska team, while limited offensively, does play defense well and is finding ways uh, to win games, which has not been the case for the Cornhuskers over the last several years. It is doing that. They need to stop turning the ball over, even against Purdue. I mean, they, yeah. you know, they, they, you know, that is it. But so is Michigan State. Both those teams have really been turnover prone. Uh, I would tend to agree with you that Michigan State, Northwest, or excuse me, Nebraska will get the job done there. Uh, but, you know, they are really, for lack of a better term, funky offensively. They weren't very good against Purdue. Now Purdue did some good things defensively. Uh, and I just don't think Michigan State can get its way out of a paper bag. And so, therefore, I think <laughs> Nebraska will get them. But, uh, boy, you better stop turning the ball over three and four times a game. And both those teams have been doing that. So it'll be the one that can hang on to the football and, and hang on to possessions. It will probably get it done. But uh, I think Nebraska's got a lot to play for. It crazy as it sounds, they might be playing it. They could play their way. They, oh they certainly God. control their own destiny in Indianapolis, as crazy as that sounds. It does sound very crazy. They are <laughs> minus nine in turnover margin and have five victories. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Minus nine. Yeah. They had four turnovers last week. Now, Purdue had three, but they had four and still won the game going away. Yeah. Wild. Well, Purdue had three and a kick and a block kick for a touchdown. So, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's out of a matter of degree, but yeah, absolutely, I'm with you on that. Maryland hosts Penn State at 330. The Nittany Lions ranked 11th, favored by eight points in this one. Penn State has just the one loss, four and one, the Big Ten, seven and one overall. Maryland suddenly has. Uh, become a little bit of a disappointment here over the last several weeks. Five and three, two and three in conference play. I don't know. Maryland has surprised me that they have not played all that well here over the last several weeks. Maybe they'll surprise me and play well on Saturday against the Nittany Lions. Right. I, I think Penn State, though, may have gotten over its hangover of the Ohio State uh, loss and the way that they played against Ohio State. But, of course, they walk into – what will be next be their next biggest game of the century against Michigan uh, next week. So Tallulah has been, you know, is good enough to, to, to give Penn State some trouble. And I, I don't think he can sleep on them totally. But again, I think Penn State is is good enough uh, and will hold, hold Maryland enough at bay that they'll get it done and set up a huge matchup next weekend in Happy Valley. 3.30 kickoff in the Twin Cities, Minnesota, 5-3, uh, 3-2 three, three in the Big Ten, hosting Illinois, 3-5, and 1-4 and four in conference play. The Gophers favored by a point and a half. Um, I'm just going to say it. This is the least exciting 5-3 and three football team I've ever seen in my entire life, speaking of the Gophers. Just, I... They're just not that nothing excites me. Nothing excites me. But you know, and they're not good offensively. They're pretty good defensively. And then under PJ Fleck, um, both teams uh, could still make some rumbles, as made crazy as it sounds. Again, that uh, uh, Illinois has got a path to winning three or four games or getting bowl eligible. How nutty is that? After what we saw in Ra or in Ross Aid Stadium. Uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, every, well, so it seems like a, a year ago, it was at least a month and a, and a week ago. But my point is, is that, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, Illinois has thrown me for a loop when they will go to Maryland and win. Um, that still still makes me think that they could go to any place and win. And, and neither and Minnesota's not a good enough offensive. That they're going to distance themselves with folks, but from folks. But uh, I still think Minnesota will get this game done because I, the Illinois team uh, that I saw in Ross A. Steve still scars me from a football perspective. So uh, I just don't think that, they can, that they're going to get the job done. If you need a good nap, head to Wrigley Field at 3.30 on oh. Saturday. Uh, Northwestern, 4-4, four and 2-3 four, and three in the Big Ten, uh, hosting Iowa, 6-2, and 3-2 and two in conference play. Iowa's favored by 5, but 
The number to watch here, Alan, is the over-under 30 and a half points, which I think actually is a little bit higher than where this game started. I think it started at 29 and a half, 28 and a half. Yeah. 30 and a half points on the over-under. You can catch a snooze between touchdowns if there are touchdowns. And this one, well, that, that's, that that's one of the, did I read this right? This is, this is one of the, for a power five, one of the smallest, lowest numbers for an over under ever. It's got to be. I believe that's right. But the wind must be blowing out on, uh, in Wrigley Field. That's the only thing I can think of why it went to 29 <laughs> to 30. It's going out to Kenmore Street or Sheffield. I don't know which way it's going. Um, you know, I, I, I and of course, I still, I did enjoy Purdue's experience two years ago up there just to be in that facility and play that game, but I don't think they're going to have it exceptionally. The Iowa will bring some people from, you know, it's got it's pretty good Chicago following. I get that. But yeah, Northwestern also has a chance to find its way wow. to the, to Indianapolis, as crazy as that sounds as well. You know, I keep looking at this. I say this every week, you know, what games can Purdue win? And if Northwestern keeps beating folks, and surprising people, that's just another game that uh, in the last game of, of the old Ryan Field was what's Purdue's going to play here and on the 18th of November, uh, just make it more difficult. But I think, again, Iowa, conventional wisdom tells you Iowa gets that game done in a 9-6 in a, in a to six fashion or a 15-10 to 10 fashion or something like that. I, I'll bet the under on that even at 30 if I was betting, but uh, you're right, it, it is uh, – you better get your coffee grinds going and get that uh, get you, get yourself ready to go for that one. No, I love games in Wrigley Field. That was a great experience. I still have had fun with that two years ago. That is the Big Ten Roundup. Let's go back in time with a historical look. Here's Alan Karthik. All right, Alan, let's hit a historical view of Purdue and Michigan. The Boilermakers in this game, last I looked, a 32.5-point underdog. That's a lot of points, Alan. This would be the biggest point spread that Purdue has faced as an underdog since 1974. It, I was 14 years old and still trying to think about even getting a date, which I didn't get many at that point. I didn't get many <laughs> that many later either. But no, yeah, I think if we look at it, uh, the Boilermakers in back in 2013, 10 years ago, uh, Thursday, against Ohio State were a 31-point underdog in that game, a game they lost the last time Purdue was shut out 56-love. But, yeah, you go back to 1974 and Purdue a 34-point underdog, and lines were different then. But uh, And then they come out and score 24 points in the first quarter against Notre Dame and beat the defending national champions 31-20. to But, yeah, there haven't been – they've had a couple of games where they've been in the high 20s as underdogs in at, in the big house. 1991, Desmond Howard and company, uh, they beat Purdue 42 to nothing in Jim Coletto's first year. Uh, there have been a couple others, but uh, it's a pretty large point spread, and uh, and we probably will discuss – it's Purdue's not exactly had a lot of success in the big house – uh, yeah. in the last 50 years. Yeah, just a couple of victories since 1966 for Purdue up there. So not only are the Boilermakers facing uh, those 32 and a half points, but history is not on Purdue's side either. Well, either is the team either either is the team that they're playing because they probably have all of Purdue's signs. You've already tipped that <laughs> subject already and uh, and they don't need that. Um, they're just really good. Yeah, it, it's two, two wins since 1966. But what's crazy about that, and this is deep into the history, Purdue won in 64, 65, and 66, and, excuse me, and 63 in the big house. So if you want kangaroo statistics, yeah, they've only won twice in the last uh, 55, 56 years, but they've won five times in the last 50 or 60. So, <laughs> you know, what, what are you going to say? But, no, it, it is extremely difficult place to play for any team, uh, let alone a team like Purdue. Purdue's had some really good teams go in there over the years. Uh, Drew Brees, his first appearance there in 1999 was a blowout. Um, uh, certainly Mark Herman had a couple chances as in the late seventies, early eighties to go to the Rose Bowl and got thumped, basically shut out in two consecutive games. Uh, though the Purdue did have one touchdown in one of those games on a punt, block punt. My point is it's a house of horrors for everybody, especially Purdue. That is the historical look at Boilermakers Wolverines. Thanks, Al. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Back in a moment with more. This is Golden Black Radio. 
On the far end of Main Street in downtown Lafayette, you'll find East End Grill, industrial and classic. The restaurant is built like a steakhouse, but handles like a bistro. East End Grill's menu includes creative starters, simple chopped salads, burgers, fresh fish, and steaks, and the signature shrimp and grits. The staff prepares every item from scratch and emphasizes simple meals that incorporate fresh, local, and seasonal ingredients. A warm and inviting dining room features a cozy bar that includes a great selection of craft beer, inspired cocktails, and a robust and expanding wine list. Whatever your entertainment needs are, a cocktail at the bar, dinner with family, or a special event in the private dining room, the energized and attentive staff is here for you. Eastern Grill in downtown Lafayette, welcome to our table. When it comes to land sales, it pays to have experts in your corner. Acre Pro Midwest Farm Group is your local farmland specialist. With decades of experience in Indiana agriculture, no one knows the market better. Whether you're doing a 1031 exchange or simply buying and selling farmland, your local Acre Pro agent will walk the land with you and ensure the deal is done right. Visit AcrePro.com or call 765-775-6502 and talk to your local land expert today. Again, 765-775-6502. At Purdue Federal Credit Union, it's about a relationship. A relationship that goes where you go, wherever you are in life. A relationship that's committed to free financial wellness resources, lower fees, and innovative digital banking solutions. Because we believe in people helping people. Let's build your financial future together. Purdue Federal Credit Union, your trusted financial partner for life. Federally insured by NCUA. Broadcasting from Golden Black World Headquarters, north of Purdue's campus, this is the Golden Black Radio Pregame Show. All right, Tom, let's talk uh, some matchups in this one, uh, Boilermakers and Wolverines. Man, where to start? Um, you know, we mentioned earlier Purdue offensively trying to get something going. I, I've said this a couple of times really over the last few weeks. I, I would like to see, you know, maybe a rolling pocket, give Hudson Card just a couple of options out there and, and a half or a third of the field, and if it's not there, just run. Um, I just think that Purdue has got to do something that's not a drop-back passing game because it's just – between the offensive line, between the receivers not getting open, and between a quarterback who understandably is feeling the pressure even maybe when the pressure's not there, uh, but certainly is feeling it when it is there, that you've got to do something. you got to do something else to help him out. Um, yeah, you're right. You've got to do something to help him out. And and I just would like to okay. see, you know, get, it, get him outside the pocket, give him a couple options. If they're not there, let them run the football and see if you can see if you can get something going offensively. Uh, you know, using a scheme that looks more like that. Yeah, you're right. I, you can't just straight drop him back. I don't think against this Michigan defense. Um, uh, so yeah, I think you're right about moving the pocket, uh, cutting the field down in the thirds for for Hudson Card, and uh, giving them some some run options as well. I tell you, uh, it'd be nice if the running backs could, could be used a little bit more in the pass game, too. The screen game, we never really see any screens. Yeah. Back of being catch the ball, tracing and catch the ball. I, I think those guys have really been underutilized as pass catchers out of the backfield. Maybe that's a wrinkle that can become a little bit more prominent. And Garrett Miller, Kyle, he's coming off a pretty rough outing last week. A couple of drops just didn't look good overall. And he, he really has. He's been out of sorts all year, coming back from that knee injury that – that scrub 2022. He needs to really step his game up, I think. They need more out of Garrett Miller if they're going to go into the big house and try to even stay close to Michigan on Saturday night. Purdue's defense has got to do something to, I mean, just almost superhuman, right? I mean, somehow keep this game uh, 0 0 in the second quarter. So, you know, yeah. uh, you just cannot afford to give up a big play that suddenly gets you behind. You know, seven nothing, fourteen to nothing, uh, and and you know make Purdue's offense have to play uphill. Purdue Purdue has got to keep this into a low scoring game for as long as possible uh, to to maybe allow it to settle in a little bit. Because if it gives up big plays early, it's it's just not going to be able to come back. Yeah, you're right. First down is going to be so key for this offense of Purdue as well. They really struggle on first down. Um, and, then, and they're behind the chains right away. They're in second and eight, second and seven. And that, that, that can set the whole drive off on, on the wrong pass. So they gotta be they got to be efficient on first down, have some, some success there as well. And, and you're right, 
the other side of the ball. Don't don't give up big plays for touchdowns. The demoralizing knockout punches. It's going to get that team revved up and then make that crowd roar. Make Michigan try to earn everything it has uh, by by having to methodically drive down the field. And uh, again, for Purdue too, the chunk plays right. They just have not been there, Kyle. Last week was just an abomination. There's only one pass over 20 yards, a 29-yard touchdown catch to Jaden Dixon Beal, and there are only two runs over 10 yards. So you're not going to beat Michigan by having 10, 11, 12 play drives. You need big, big plays to score or have any chance to score here for, for Purdue. So, yeah, the offense is going to be stressed to do that against this defense, I think. Tom, who do you got on Saturday night? Some ways it's going to be like Rocky One, Kyle. Just going the distance and not getting knocked out. Even if you lose the decision, it's going to be a victory for Purdue. So if Purdue can at least cover, I think it will be a victory. Um, I don't think they're going to cover, Kyle. I, I, I think I put in a score of Michigan 50, Purdue 6. I think they're going to score a touchdown and miss the extra point. How about that? Yeah, two field goals would seem a little bit extreme uh, <laughs> right now. It would. It Let's would, not talk about the field goal kicking. That's been rough too. I mean, that's been a, a sore spot. Uh, you know, unfortunately for Purdue, it's been a sore spot that hasn't mattered. I mean, you if you're going to miss field yeah. goals, you want those. I mean, in some ways, you want those to matter. Uh, True. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, let's not sugarcoat it here. This is going to be a rough one for Purdue. Uh, you know, not impossible, but Purdue it needs a lot to go its direction. Has Michigan has to make uh, atypical mistakes, uh, allow some big plays to Purdue, allow Purdue to score on defense, maybe on special teams, something, get a short field. I mean, even though Nebraska let Purdue get a couple short fields and, and Purdue wasn't able to take advantage of that last week, uh, I, I just don't see it happening. I, I think your assessment early on in the podcast is right that a little bit concerned that Michigan is galvanized by this week um, yeah. and feels like it has to go out and prove something, prove that it's not just uh, stealing signs and thus uh, winning football games. And so Purdue could be walking into walking into something up there in, in Michigan. I'll, I'll take the Wolverines forty-five to seven. I think they cover the 32 and a half points. Uh, the Boilermakers avoid the shutout, but it's it's going to be a rough one, I think, for Purdue. Better days ahead, uh, we think, uh, but uh, but a rough one on, on Saturday night. Thank you, Tom. Take care, buddy. That'll do it for our podcast for this week. Uh, thanks to our sponsors. As always, if you do like the podcast, please rate us five stars on your favorite podcast app. Leave us a comment as well. All right, that'll do it for our show for Tom Deanhart, Brian Newbert, and Alan Karpik. I'm Kyle Charters. Thanks for listening. This is Golden Black Radio.